Uh, our uh, first speaker in the morning is uh, Christoph Schutt from Berlin, and he is talking about unifying machine learning and quantum chemistry. So, Christoph, the stage is yours. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, and yeah, a bit sad that I, I couldn't join or, uh, in person because I, I thought it was, yeah, with the COVID numbers rising in, in Germany in the beginning of November, I thought uh, I, uh, I changed my mind. and do this online now but i hope uh, i can get uh, uh, my 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 point across in this format and uh, discuss with you afterwards uh, yeah so unifying machine learning and quantum chemistry um this um so the the main idea um we had here and this was was a perspective with uh Julia Westermeier, um, Michael Gastegger, and uh, Reinhard Maurer, we uh, wrote at the beginning of this year was that um, when you look at the computational chemistry workflow, um, like sketched here on the on the right, uh, there are a couple or there are a lot of steps you can look at and you can basically use machine learning in, in, yeah, in a lot of them, if not all of them. So first you have um, yeah, the model selection and model building space where you choose how to model your uh, chemical system. Then you want to do some electronic structure calculation. And um, yeah, we all know that takes can take uh, quite some time and you have to choose a level of theory and so on. And then you normally want to do something like structure exploration uh, where you look for um, yeah, novel compounds or you want to um, yeah, do a molecular dynamic simulation. And in the end, of course, you also want to connect uh, these results uh, to experiment, for example, with uh, computa uh, computational spectroscopy. Yeah, and we wrote this respect, uh, perspective and then pointed out um, at what, what kind of machine learning has already been developed at certain steps. And uh, on the left side here, you see some things uh, that uh, we have developed in our group uh, uh, about that. So um, the first part, uh, potential energy, energy surfaces and property prediction. Um, yeah, this is what I mainly um, was concerned about in my PhD. So how to represent an atomistic system and predict um, yeah, the energy or other chemical properties. Um, then um, the other way around, uh, generative models. So if you, if you if you are looking for a, a certain compound, uh, but and you know which uh, properties it, it should have, uh, but you don't know the structure, so then uh, generative models can help, like uh, or recently uh, developed CG Schnet. Um, or even if you if you want to look at the electronic structure, uh, you can use a method like Schnorps or, yeah. Now recently there was um, was some some uh, more work on on that by some people of our group, um, where you can actually predict uh, molecular orbitals. Uh, in in the end, um, you might also also want to look at uh, response properties and solvent effects. So looking at how a molecule behaves uh, in an in a chemical environment. Uh, and today in this talk, I want to highlight two um, parts of that, which is uh, the uh, pain neural network, which is our recent uh, representation for atomistic systems, and then FieldSnet for uh, looking at the solvent effects. So, okay, how can you actually present, represent an atomic environment? And so the there are many components that were talked about already yesterday uh, that that uh, flow into that. So um, one of that uh, are convolutional neural networks. Um, so you see here on the right side, um, uh, this illustration of the, of the ethanol uh, molecule. And um, if you if you if you remember the very first talk yesterday, 
uh, there was this explanation of how a new convolution a new network works, right? So you take, you have an image and you know pixels that uh, lie close, uh, close to each other um, are more correlated than pixel, pixels that are far apart. And you can say the same uh, for, for atoms, right? If atoms are close together in space, uh, they are interacting more than if they are further apart. So um, it, it's a yeah, straightforward idea to apply a convolutional neural network uh, directly to a molecule. The problem is, however, uh, that in images, you have this grid, right? You have a grid of pixels, and you can uh, basically have this convolution filter that you shift over this grid. Um, but it, with molecules, it's, it's not possible like that, because instead of pixels, now you have atoms. And you can't just, uh, just um, yeah, have a discrete filter. So here the idea was with the continuous filter convolution to instead use a neural network as a filter that um, yeah, basically is a continuous function over space. And if you do that, you see the formula in the bottom. That's basically just the formula of a, of a convolution where you have discrete points, which are the atoms but um, continuous filters. So the distances between the atoms can be continuous. And if you use that and yeah, build a convolutional neural network uh, this way, you can actually get a smooth energy function. While if you would basically uh, put a pixel, a pixel grid over this atom, you would have discretization errors. So you would have jumps in your potential energy surface. Um, another way to formulate that was shortly after uh, we published our first paper that went along this direction um, proposed by Gilmer, which is called the message passing neural network framework. And this is basically a general formulation of graph neural networks uh, where you say, okay, if I have um, a node in a graph or in our case, an atom in a molecule, um, I can model it by, um, modeling uh, message passes between the nodes in the graph or interactions between the, the atoms. So for example, in hydrogen, you see on the top right, if you have the, uh, on, the, <laughs> on the water molecule, you see on the top right, you have the, the oxygen in the middle. And if you want to represent it, um, you basically receive messages from the two hydrogen atoms. And yeah, here you see on the left side, this general formulation. And uh, so basically you have a message I uh, that is received in the or example by the oxygen. And this is a sum over all neighbors. And then you have this message function MT that depends on the, or can depend on the S is the, basically the, disc, the representation of atom I. So the center atom oxygen here uh, then Sj uh, is uh, then the neighboring atom and then the distance between those. Or in a general case, instead of the distance, you could have some kind of edge label in a graph. And um, if you now have this, uh, this message, you can have another function, uh, which is another neural network that takes this, um, uh, takes this message and the old state and gives you a new state of the of the atom. And if you look at this, this looks really um, uh, similar to the continuous filter convolution. And you can basically reformulate a continuous filter convolution network um, as a message passing neural network. One important aspect you should um, yeah should you should fulfill is that if you want to predict a uh, uh, scalar property like the, um, like the energy, uh, you should fulfill rotational invariant, uh, invariance. So if, you, uh, if, you're, um, if your input rotates, so the molecule is rotating in space, then uh, this should not change the energy. And a simple way to do that in the message passing new networks is by just having a rotationally invariant message function um, so that the, the message of X 
is equal to the message of the rotated x. And in this case, since the message function, function is only taking the distance between atoms, and this is automatically fulfilled because the distance is, of course, rotationally invariant. Now, there are actually some limitations to rotation, uh, rotational invariant message passing. And that is um, caused by um, a cutoff because, um, yeah, so, so you always, if you, if you build a neural network, you always have to think about how large and how complicated is the space I want to model. And it's, of course, if you have a neighborhood, a very local neighborhood with a small cutoff, it's much, um, much easier to model than a 50 angstrom radius. If you have a crystal or a large mo molecule. Um, so it's from, from this generalization standpoint, it's, it's much better to have a small cutoff and basically assemble your representation from these small pieces. Beyond that, there's also um, a scaling argument. So um, if I have um, a small cutoff, my uh, neural network scales linearly with a number of atoms, and it's, but it scales uh, quadratically with the uh, atoms within the cutoff because I have to look at all the interactions there. Um, so um, uh, if you now have a, a rotation invariant neural network that only looks at distances, that means that once you put a cutoff uh, on the molecule, um, you will lose some information. So here is an example. So you have these two structures here, A and B. And we have this, this, this cutoff. So for the red uh, node in the graph here, you have this red cutoff. And then here you have this blue cutoff. And if you only look at distances, both um, structures actually look the same. And that's because you're missing the distance between uh, the, the two white nodes uh, at the edge here. Uh, since this is out of the cutoff, you can't distinguish these, these two structures. Um, so actually, if you want to still retain uh, this information, you have to add uh, more than rotationally invariant, and that where, that's where equivariance, uh, equivariance comes in. So here the idea is that now, instead of just having these distances and rotation invariance, we also want to retain some directional information. Uh, so uh, that means, so rotation equivariance means instead of having um, our representation being invariant, so if I rotate the input, the representation stays the same, I want it to be equivariant. That means that the um, representation is actually uh, vector valued. And when I rotate my input, I also rotate uh, my representation uh, the same. So, so now we have R times the message uh, of X equals the message of the rotated X. So R is, has to be a rotation here. So that's basically a linearity constraint uh, on rotations. And um, fortunately, um, uh, we can just as easily ensure that uh, as we did uh, with the uh, rotation invariance, we have just to restrict the operations that are part of the message function. So we can have any nonlinear function of scalars. Um, we can scale vectors. Um, we can have linear combinations of equivariant vectors uh, that we constructed before. Uh, and we can have vector products and scalar products. So these are equivariant operations that we can just use as building blocks of a network. And, um, and to give you a bit of an overview what, what that means here on the, on the right side is a table, um, what of, of things we can use as features in our, uh, in our representation. So the first column is the distances case that we've seen before. So we only use distances and that scales linear. So it this case linearly with the number with the neighbors in the environment. Uh, then the next would be um, 
we, we could use angles, but then we have the problem um, that now we have to look at triples of atoms. So the scales quadratic, quadratically with atoms in the environment for each environment. Um, and in the end, if we have an equivalent network, we basically co uh, combine distances and directions. And if we uh, also have directions that scales uh, also linearly, and we can still resolve angles um, without uh, the quadratic scale. So this is now the, the, the pain network we built out of that, which is basically an equivariant extension of the network, uh, net network we had before. And um, it's using the same continuous convolution we had before this is uh, for the for the scalar features and um, for the vectorial features now uh, we're using um, basically um, equivariant convolutions or uh, which is also called steerable convolutions in in the machine learning literature so here we basically um, have a convolution of a um, in in the, in the first sum here we have a convolution of a vectorial feature with a scalar uh, filter. And in the second, we have a scalar uh, feature convoluted with, a, with an equivariant filter, so which is a yeah, vector valued filter. And you can obtain that, uh, for example, just by taking an invariant filter and taking the derivative with respect uh, to these Rij interatomic vectors. And yeah, here's um, a practical example or a more practical example how this directional information can now be propagated beyond the cutoff. Um, so uh, first of all, on the top right, you see the example again from, from before. And actually, even with angles, you could not distinguish these two, uh, uh, these two uh, geometries. While now, if we have uh, equivariance and we have vectorial representations in the atoms here, you see that the sign of the, of the components of these vectors are, are changing. So with uh, equivariant uh, features, we can't actually distinguish these structures. And on the left, we see this in a, in a real chemical system where we have, um, we, have a ferro we have a substituted ferrocene um, where we now uh, rotate these two rings um, against each other. And here we plot uh, the corresponding energy profile as learned by the network. And uh, we used uh, the SNET, uh, which uses only invariant features, then DIMNET, which uses angles and distances, and then PAIN uh, using the equivariant features. And we have here several uh, cutoffs. And if you have a large cutoff of four angstrom, well, large for this system uh, at least, um, you see all the networks can capture this energy profile. Then at three angstrom, um, Schnett is failing because it only has distances. And at 2.5 angstrom, even a diamond net with the angles is failing and only pain can capture the rotation of, of these rings against each, uh, each other. And that is actually because, yeah, at these at these smaller cutoffs, um, only distances. Uh, so the distances between atoms of the ring are outside of the cutoff, so you can't um, reconstruct the rotation of the rings um, just from distances. You have to have more information and use this uh, center atom. Okay, um, yeah, here are also some, some examples on, on the ND17 data set. So these are um, various uh, molecular dynamics uh, trajectories for small molecule. Um, and you see here um, that the pain gets comp uh, yeah, similar results as the FCHL kernel method. As, as on, a, on a very small data set. So that means this equivariance also gives you a lot of uh, data efficiency compared to rotationally invariant uh, 
methods like SHNET, FISNET, and DIMENET. Uh, perhaps one thing I should say, if you now have this uh, equivariant uh, representation, since you have this linearity constraint on the, uh, on the rotation, that means you can always go back to a rotationally invariant scalar. So that, that is of course needed if you want to predict an, the energy, which is of course rotationally invariant uh, in, this, in this network, because you just have to take the norm of, of a vector and then you're back at rotation invariant. Okay, another advantage of having uh, rotationally equivariant uh, features is that now that you have vectors, you can build higher order ten tensors out of that for tensorial property prediction. So a simple case would be the dipole moment where you just predict um, atomic dipole moments um, here, this new atom from the vector value representations uh, you get uh, directly out of the network. And um, now you all you can basically uh, construct the molecular dipole moment using these um, atomic dipole moments plus um, um, basically a shift to the center of the atom using this uh, predict the charge for each atom times the position of the atom. Um, and you can construct higher order tensors using this kind of formula, which is just a rank one um, uh, tensor factorization. Uh, so you can factorize each tensor into a tensor product uh, like this. Um, and here in the bottom, you see an example how you could build a polarizability tensor uh, like this. So you have a scalar put, uh, component in, the, in the, the first term here. And then you have um, a rank two, uh, rank two components using the outer products of, your, um, of, of a function of your representation per, uh, of each atom with the position of, of, of the atom. And if you now have these kind of properties, you can use that to predict several um, molecular spectra. Um, so here we simulated um, aspirin. So we did a, a ring polymer MD for aspirin with 64 beads. Uh, that would have actually taken us 25 five years uh, on, a, on a normal computer node, but with a, with a um, trained neural network, we could do that in one hour instead. And yeah, you see infrared spectra um, predicted from our uh, predicted dipole moments and then Raman spectra for the, for the polarizabilities. And you see here um, um, the, the experiment uh, on the, for ethanol in gray in the background. And then you see the red is a normal MD uh, predicted by the neural network, and then in blue, the ring polymer MD. And you see that this is the, the ring polymer MD here is already matching nicely uh, the experiment. And on the right side, you see the same uh, for aspirin. Here we only compare to the uh, static spectra um, from quantum mechanics. Um, yeah. So per perhaps that's a good good time to ask if, if there are questions on that part. Otherwise, I have another th the the field net part I want to talk about. Or you could also ask ask in the end. Yeah, thank you, uh, Christoph. We have a question um, from Lorenzo. If you'd like to ask your question. Uh, yes, in any case, it is in the chat. Uh, it's not really related on intel artificial intelligence, actually. But was about this um, <clears throat> angle issue between the two, the two structures. Mm -hmm. uh, I have the impression I might be wrong, but I have the impression that if I take the alpha angle with its sign, it is possible actually to distinguish between two, the two structures. So, isn't it? Uh, isn't yeah, there a way to, to to include this information? Well, if you if you want a sign in the in the angle, that would mean you need to somehow 
de define an order of atoms, right? Right. Yeah. If so, uh, it, it might be less efficient. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm okay I, with. I, that. I don't know. So, so, so the, the thing is, you in your neural network, you also want to be permutation invariant. So I think if you want to have the angles, what you need would be permutational equivariance instead here, right? Because because you need to index, to, you need to know which is which atom to determine the sign of the of of the angle. But that might also be a possibility. But because essentially that's that's what this vector is, right? It's giving you a, a face, basically. So. If I want to keep this information, like the ang the, the the sign of this the angle, which is, which means the order of the atoms, actually I lose features in the in the algorithm, in particular the the permutation invariance. Is it right? Yes. So okay. you would would need to give that up at least temporarily, and perhaps you might be okay in later. Okay. In any case, I mean, there is no no gain in okay. Yeah, it might be possible, but I don't know from my head now. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so we have a question here. Um, so please go ahead. Yeah, can you can you hear me, Christoph? Yes. Okay, good. So um, now in the previous slide, the same slide that you were talking about, what um, you had. Um, the way you talked about the angles of. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this one. So uh, let's say now you want to create a representation for a data set, and uh, you have two isomers of the same uh, molecule in the data set. So to di distinguish between the two isomers, you would somehow, I would assume you'd need like some center defined for each atom from which you would compute the angles, right? This, uh, these vectors, isn't it? So how do you compute these vectors? Do you have like a fixed center for each molecule no, or? No, no, the set, it's, so the, the, the representation are always centered on each atom. So there's a representation for each atom in the molecule. Okay. That's the center. Ah, okay. So uh, um, I don't know, perhaps that was, so this center here, that's just an iron atom. That's not a, center <laughs> if you if that was the confusion yeah probably but, uh, okay um so here th this is just an example where we, we have this ferrocene where you have the iron atom in the middle of the two rings because this is this example as this is a part where you basically um only have this iron atom within the 2.5 angstrom environment to um to connect the two rings basically all right Okay, good. Thanks. Okay, thank you. We also have a question um, from Johannes, if you'd like to go ahead. <clears throat> Hello, Christoph. Uh, thank you. Uh, this was a very nice talk and very nice work in general. I, I have to say, though, I have a little bit of, a, of, a, of an issue with the scaling argument you made um, with respect to angles versus directions. So I think there's, there's good, good uh, it's a good idea to use the directions, but just in terms of the scaling, I mean, scaling is an asymptotic thing, right? So for going to very large systems, this will dominate. But there's no, like within the cutoff, the, the atom, number of atoms will not go to infinity in, under any circumstances. Yeah, so just right. because the density of, of matter is kind of a, a constant if I, if I move to extensive systems. So I don't really see that as, a, as an issue. Like if anything, that changes the prefactor of the method, but it doesn't yeah. change the okay. scaling. Right, so if you, if you, uh, you, well, it is of course a scaling with a cutoff, if you would would go to large cutoffs, um, but normally you have a limited cutoff. That's correct. But still, if you switch from linear to quadratic, uh, and you you can, might well have fifty atoms, and each uh, each each pair needs a larger neural network. Then that adds up, and um, especially if you want to do MD trajectories. Uh, so so I can. So, for example, or pain, um, I think for aspirin, including forces, it takes, I think, yeah, about 10 milliseconds now in our current representation. I think 
there was this large time net that was 50 to 100 milliseconds or something mm -hmm. and that really adds up um so i think it's important to also look look at this this kind of uh, prefactor yeah but it's a prefactor so i th I'm, I'm, yeah. my, my, it's mainly a notational issue yeah, 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 because sure. big o notation is for asymptotic it's, that's a, it's in in theory it's scaling in practice it's a prefactor yeah yeah good okay yeah. thank you Okay. okay, thank you. Then, then I will go on to the second part I wanted to talk about, which is um, uh, response properties. Because I just showed you these, these um, uh, dipole moments and polarizabilities, and they are actually response properties. So instead of constructing them as uh, from these as, as tensorial properties, from these uh, equivalent representations, uh, we can also directly model them as response property in a field dependent neural network. And yeah, this is what we did in FieldNet. This uh, predates uh, the pain network, uh, but we all already had some uh, ideas about these um, um, yeah, equivariant representations. And here, these manifest as some kind of uh, local atomic dipoles uh, that we have in our network that are actually equivalent features. And this is mainly worked by Michael uh, Gastecker here. Um, so, and the idea was to take the normal SCHNET with the distances and extend it by this field SCHNET module, which uh, models the interaction of our network with an external uh, field. And that could be an electric field or a magnetic field this is not really um yeah defined so we can can choose that freely and yeah just like before we have uh, vector value representations that are now yeah interpreted inter interpreted as local dipoles um, ui here and um, we have an interaction with the uh, external felt fx here um and that's basically modeled as dipole-dipole interactions. And by that we can uh, as, uh, and now also, um, on invariant representation are basically stigalas and can be written in analog to our local dipoles considered as, as something like charges. So we can model the, the interaction between uh, or um, between the, the vectors and the uh, uh, and the scalars like a charge dipole interaction. So this is what we did here. And in the end, we could predict an energy. And since we have now this influence of the external field, we, we can take various kinds of response properties. Of course, the forces we had before, which is just the response uh, with respect to the atom positions. But now we also have uh, uh, the dipole moment as uh, the response to the field. Uh, the, the polarizability as a, as a yeah, second derivative, uh, but we could also have things like um, uh, chemical shifts here. And yeah, using this response, we can train a, a common model um, that can predict all these response properties. Um, by, yeah, by predicting the energy and then taking the derivatives to, to, the, to the respective fields. So that means with the same model, we can predict um, infrared spectra, Raman spectra, or even NMR spectra. Um, since we now have this, this external field as an input, we can actually go beyond just the response and um, apply a field to the network. And um, we use that here to uh, model solvent effects. Uh, so we can use um, a polarizable continuum solvent to connect to our neural network. And then model here in this example, an, ethan an explicit ethanol in an ethanol solution. Or we can even um, connect to a force field and uh, use the field interaction to do an MLMM simulation in analog to a QMMM simulation, where we now have one explicit um, 
neural network modeled um, molecule uh, trained on electronic structure data and have the solvent modeled by a, a traditional force field. And here you see uh, the spectra uh, for the different methods. So ML in vacuum is the, the dotted, dotted line. And then the point in blue, the polarizable, polarizable continuum solvent, and in red, the ML, MM simulation. Um, an application of this idea is now uh, the uh, Gleisen rearrangement reaction. And um, here we um, modeled the um, reaction barrier using um, uh, this ML MM simulation. And you see, if we do that with a model, you, you, you clearly see here how the, uh, in red, how the reaction barrier gets lower for this reaction if you have uh, a water solvent uh, you uh, modeled by a, by a, a charm force field. Um, so uh, actually, now when, since we, when we did that, we had the idea, wait a minute, we can now actually optimize uh, with respect to the external field. So um, because we have this analytic a neural network model that we can just uh, yeah, differentiate. So why not actually optimize, uh, look for the optimal field uh, to do this reaction, right? Uh, so yeah, we did that and we uh, basically found um, this here uh, as the optimal field for the reaction barrier. So you see here, uh, the reaction barrier initially was at about 30 kcal, and we can get down to 10 kcal if we use a field with these, uh, where, where you see here the positive and negative uh, regions. Um, and of course, this this um, this environment of, is of course artificial. You will never really get this perfect environment. Uh, but what you can do is you can um, approximate it by putting um, uh, these um, amino acids in the in the um, um, around the molecule, and then you see if you if you do that. So and this is just manually placed here. Uh, you still get uh, you can basically um, yeah imitate this optimal uh, field, and you still get uh, 20, um, 20 k kcal reaction barrier instead of thirty. Um, yeah, and in, in, in future work, uh, it would be really interesting to use this uh, to automatically uh, create these environments or even find a special, so actual, I mean, you can of course not hold these in place, but find uh, solvents uh, directly to optimize uh, this field environment. So, and with that, uh, I conclude my talk, talked about the uh, pain for equivalent message passing and about uh, FieldNet as an application uh, of, of that uh, idea of using um, equivariant features and how to use that to solve a model solvent effect. And yeah, with that, I uh, thank you for your attention and I'm open to more questions. Okay, thank you very much, Krista. Okay, so um, do we have any questions today? There you go, please. Yeah, um, thanks for the nice talk. I, I have a question regarding uh, the coupling of your field net with the polarizable continuum model. Uh, you sh if I get it right, you should have some sort of an iterative procedure here, right? To, to sort of get the response from the, from, the, from the solvent field back into the network. Is that right? Uh, one second. Uh, uh, my slides are hanging. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically, um, the way we did that was, and that was mainly the practical. The practical part was mainly Michael Gastecker here. So um, we basically directly took 
for, for training, we directly took data from, from Orca. So we, we directly connected that. So we have this external field and we see how, how the energy is um, influenced by this external field and we, we can do that. Um, and then bas basically, yes, we have to, There needs to be a yeah good question because then i have then i have a follow-up yeah. i mean you said that you're evaluating your neural neck that's like takes like i don't know 50 milliseconds or something so how long does it take to do the solvent field then because that also takes time and if you have to do it iteratively that adds as well so i was sort of interested in comparing comparing the times of the neural net versus the solvent field okay so this this detailed question i would delegate to Michael, uh, but it, it should, I mean, it's a force field. It shouldn't be too, uh, it should be, I guess, I would say it's sim on similar um, level as a neural network and because it, it's just an ethanol. So that it's that, just a couple of milliseconds, of, of course. And um, I, I think the, the I mean, basically, the the feedback uh, to the to the solvent is done exactly like like it's like it's done for the uh, for the quantum mechanics. Uh, uh -huh. If it's to, uh, if it's so, uh, I mean, we uh, we have the dipole. I'm not sure whether it's just coupled by the dipole and the charges. Probably. Yeah. So because in that I, case, I have to look that up again. Because, uh, yeah, thanks. I, I would be very interested because in that case, yeah. I would imagine that maybe at some point, if you go to larger molecules, which your neural net can still do, you start eventually to become limited by the by the PCM or whatever you're doing for the for that response. Oh, by the PCM, probably not. No, but uh, because that's just uh, that's just a simple analytic model, right? But ah, okay. for the for the for the uh, force field, but it's no it's it's a force field it's so fast i think that oh. will take a very complex <laughs> solvent to to be uh, more complicated than a neural network because that's that's uh, i guess i mean force fields are like in the microsecond regime rather than the millisecond regime right so i don't think that's a limiting factor in time but um i think you can write me an email and then I can yes, provide you with all the details you want. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, yeah maybe just a very quick question. The huge net um, is also implemented for solids already, or? Um, we did not try that, but so net is for solids. Yeah. Um, or is available for solids. I have a look at the at the where is it now? My slides are here. Is there a problem that I obviously see? No, it should work. I I would say that perhaps in the in the implementation there might be some adjustments that need to be made, but uh, it should be from the method point, it should be possible to apply it to solids. Of course, how it works in practice, you have, if you want to try it, you have to find out, out for yourself there. Yeah, for sure. Surprises. Um, but yeah, from the, from the mass, there's nothing against applying it to solids. Yeah, and the code is also, as it, I mean, interface with the SHNET code, it should work already, I guess. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Are there any further questions? Oh, yeah, we have a message from Johannes again. If you'd like to go ahead. Uh, yeah, just, just um, maybe uh, related to this question about, about the solids. Um, I guess the one thing that could be um, a showstopper or, or at least require some um, uh, additional development for solids would be the dipole dipole interaction, right? Because that's long ranged and. Uh... Yeah, so actually, um, we're currently working on, uh, on the new version of Schnappack to. Um, yeah, um, which is on a toolbox. And there we have uh, support for long range stuff. So basically what you would do is you take a larger cutoff for the long range things, and then you only 
uh, take your neural network in the in the, uh, in the short range, and then you apply a long range correction afterwards. But still using a cutoff, so no eval summation or something like that. Yeah, you can know if if it's periodic. We also have eval summation. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Does that have a team? We can like thank Christoph again. Thank you.